Hello aviation fans! After completing the story of the large Soviet white body airliners, we can finally come back to America, to the glorious time of birth of the first generation of white body aircraft, to a time when people barely heard about Airbus, and in the United States, Boeing was far from being the absolute industry leader. And despite the fact that the Boeing 747 immediately received the title of the Queen of the Skies, in that sky it was not alone. There were a few other giants ready to challenge it for the throne. DC-10 is a three-engine wide-body airliner developed by McDonnell Douglas in the early 1970s. Given the chronology, the DC-10 is the second wide-body passenger plane in the world, falling slightly behind the Jumbo. The history of the DC-10, like the history of the Boeing 747, began with the US Air Force program to create a new large strategic transport, deployed in 1963. The main participants of the tender to develop a heavy military transport aircraft were Boeing, Lockheed and Douglas. In the end, in 1965, the Lockheed project became a winner, and their plane is now known as the Galaxy C-5. However, after the defeat, neither Boeing nor Douglas abandoned their projects, continuing on their own initiative. And if one of the major companies supporting Boeing was Pan American, who wanted to have a truly huge airliner, a number of other operators adopted the prospects of such a large aircraft. Yes, at that time the supersonic concept already lost to the concept of high capacity. The future success of white body airliners became obvious, but the capacity should also have limits. A huge double-deck airliner with a wing of absolutely crazy dimensions and super-powerful engines. While Quan Tri required such an aircraft, some of his colleagues considered the jumbo jet too enormous. It wasn't clear that such capacity will be in demand, and nobody really knew how to maintain these giants on the ground. In 1966 the skepticism crystallized. American Airlines presented its vision for the future of civilian aviation. They also needed a roomy wide-body airliner, capable of performing long-range flights. But this aircraft could be smaller than the Boeing 747 and, more importantly, it had to be able to work with the existing ground infrastructure. In 1967 the Douglas Aircraft Company and the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation merged to form McDonnell Douglas, and together they took on that task. The future aircraft was extremely important. It was to be the first project of the joint corporation and its flagship. As a basis, the Douglas CX HLS program model was adopted. In its initial research, Douglas worked on a plane that could compete directly with the Boeing 747, huge and roomy. However, after the American Airlines proposal, it was decided to create a smaller version. A wide-body aircraft with one passenger deck accommodating up to 400 passengers. 150 less than the Jumbo. In this case, it was decided to use a group of three engines as a power plant. This scheme can be considered unusual for modern wide-body planes, divided into four and two engine versions. But considering that the DC-10 was the second aircraft of its class, it was too early to talk about what is usual and what is not. Such a choice was the result of a combination of several factors. Firstly, the new turbofan engines were quite powerful, and the four-engine scheme was already unnecessary in terms of thrust and unsuitable for the economy. According to fuel consumption per passenger seat, the airliner would have lost to the 747s. The Jumbo's power plant has more fuel consumption, but it can accommodate more people. It was possible to reduce the number of engines to two, but, despite the high power, two engines were not enough to provide efficient flight performance to the airliner of the given size and capacity. The idea of creating an airliner with a slightly smaller capacity with two engines was considered a potentially promising. We know the Airbus A300 was exactly this type. However, in the early 1970s, the ETOPS limitation on twin-engine airliners was still strict, requiring that the aircraft would not depart far from the alternate airports. This fact greatly restricted long-range flights. It was not clear when these rules would be changed, and the huge airliner, unable to fly across the ocean in a country surrounded by oceans, was a guaranteed failure. So the answer was pretty clear. Three engines were considered an excellent solution. 
But, having left the competition with the Boeing's flagship, McDonnell Douglas entered the fierce competition with Lockheed, which were actively developing their own three-engine wide-body L-1011 TriStar. By the end of the 1960s, the competition between two companies became as rigid as possible. However, in 1968, McDonnell Douglas secured an advantage by signing a contract with American Airlines. The Lockheed planes was potentially more advanced, but its cost price eventually was higher and a number of technical innovations could lead to delays in deliveries. In addition, American Airlines greatly benefited on the competition of suppliers and achieved a reduction in the supply price for future DC-10s. For McDonnell Douglas, it was a big victory. Following the order for 25 aircraft from one of the flagship airlines, another 30 aircraft were ordered by the United Airlines, and the portfolio of options reached 30 planes. The work was very active. McDonnell Douglas wanted to outrun Lockheed. Finally, in August 1970, the prototype DC-10 made its maiden flight, several months ahead of its competitor. During the test program, the DC-10 spent more than 1500 hours in the air and received a type certificate in July 1971. A month later, the first plane in delivery of American Airlines flew from Los Angeles to Chicago. And, in terms of comfort and luxury, it could easily compete with the 747. Ok, let's take a look on this giant. The DC-10 is a wide-body airliner. The power plant is represented by three turbofan engines, two of which are suspended on pylons under the wing, and the third is located at the base of the vertical tail, in a separate nestle outside the fuselage. Not quite usual. As the basic power plant, the modern for that time General Electric CF-6 based on the TF-39 engines from the C5 Galaxy were installed on the DC-10. These engines were quite good, and with time, they were installed on many wide-body Douglas, Boeing and Airbus planes. The onboard avionics complex was sufficiently advanced for its time. The cockpit was designed for three crew members, two pilots and a flight engineer. Later, some of the onboard systems and interfaces underwent a profound modernization, unifying the DC-10 with the MD-11. This version did not require the flight engineer, and optimized the operation for the airlines, which had both models in their fleets, for example Federal Express. The landing gear of the early series had three legs. The main landing gear was equipped with four-wheeled buggies with an advanced braking system. Later modifications became heavier. They demanded a reinforced gear and received additional support with a two-wheeled buggy located under the fuselage. The application of the optimal design and advanced technology provided the DC-10 a certain advantage over the Queen of the Skies. The Boeing 747, being superior to any other aircraft in terms of capacity and range, was however very demanding to the airfields and services, which was a serious problem for Boeing at the initial stage of operation. The DC-10, while quite capacious and efficient, also proved to be much more accessible for the ground infrastructure. The passenger cabin of the airliner received a width of 218 inches, almost 2 feet less than the 747's, and had a maximum certificated capacity of 380 passengers. However, such a capacity was not achieved in practice. The basic equipment included 285 seats in a two-class layout, according to the 2 plus 2 plus 2 scheme in the business class and 2 plus 5 plus 2 in the economy class. However, the first planes delivered to the starting customers had a luxury cabins, since they represented a reputational interest for the operators and the manufacturer alike. The American Airlines planes accommodated 206 passengers in a two-class layout, with the application of the recreation areas and bars, and the economy class had a layout of 2 plus 4 plus 2 with the additional of small tables in the central row. The United version was also luxury and accommodated 222 passengers. The first generation of airliners was named DC-10-10. This aircraft had a maximum takeoff weight of 430,000 pounds and a range of just over 3,800 miles. These planes were created first of all for flights within the United States. The aircraft received cargo modifications as well as the version Dash 15 with more powerful engines, increased range, increased mass and the ability to work with high temperatures and altitudes. These planes were delivered mainly to the Central America. 
For the implementation of transcontinental flights, a long-range DC-10-30 version was created. It received boosted engines, its maximum takeoff mass increased to 572,000 pounds, and the flight range to 6,600 miles, which allowed the plane to compete with the Boeing 747. The increased mass demanded an additional landing gear. Model DC-10-30 became the most popular in the family and was very popular in Europe. The starting customers were Swiss Air and KLM, which received the first airliners in 1972. Naturally, the model received cargo versions, as well as the ER version with an extended range. The alternative to the version Dash 30 was the DC-10-40. Unlike the Dash 30, it was equipped with the Pratt Whitney JT-9D engines. This solution meant that now the DC-10 is offered with two optional General Electric or Pratt Whitney engines, which gave McDonnell Douglas an advantage over Lockheed that didn't have any alternatives. The same version with JT-9D allowed the airlines to optimize the maintenance, since at that time the Boeing 747 was equipped with the same engines. The aircraft was certified in 1972 as the DC-10-20. However, the starting customer, Northwest Orient Airlines, asked to change the index from Dash 20 to Dash 40, as it positioned its new airliners as the newest and most advanced ones, hence the figures should be greater. The usual marketing. Versions Dash 30 and Dash 40, not counting the engines, are not that different from each other. It's curious that different versions of airliners had different power plants, wingspan, fuel capacity and a number of other indicators but McDonnell Douglas put almost no change into the fuselage. Its length and capacity in all versions are the same. One of the major customers of the McDonnell Douglas was the US Air Force. The KC-10 Extender aerial tanker was an addition to the KC-135 Strata tanker to support aviation at long distances from bases, where the 135s did not reach. The total of 60 aircraft were delivered, most of which are still in operation. McDonnell Douglas was considering the idea of creating the version DC-10-50, equipped with two Rolls-Royce RB211 engines. But the calculations showed that the plane is too heavy for two engines. The idea was abandoned. During the operation, the DC-10 airliners were involved in 55 accidents, 32 of which were serious accidents and disasters that led to deaths of total 1,261 people. The aircraft was a victim of terrorist attacks and hijacks. However, it did not avoid the design problems, which several times proved to be the cause of serious incidents. For example, the defective complex mechanism of locks on the cargo compartment door several times led to the door opening in flight with very bad consequences. And if in the incident at Windsor in 1972 the plane hardly landed, with a dozen people getting injured, then at Paris in 1974 a similar opening of the door led to the air crash and death of 346 people. Such cases, coupled with a number of other air crashes, led to spread of the opinion that the DC-10 is an unsafe aircraft, which had a very negative impact on its sales. Despite the relatively high reliability during the subsequent period, it could not restore its public reputation. Production of the DC-10 lasted less than 20 years. The first operator since 1971 was American Airlines, and the final delivery was performed with the transfer of 446 aircraft to the Nigeria Airways in 1988. Ironically, in case of this aircraft, marketers of the company almost accurately guessed. Initially, it was assumed that 438 aircraft would be delivered. Nevertheless, reputational problems after the accidents did not allow the plane to quickly conquer the market and the niche of three-engine wide-body airliners was under pressure from the Boeing 747 from above and, surprisingly, the successful Airbus A300 and A310 from below. Immediately after the completion of the DC-10 production, McDonnell Douglas began active work on its successor. Two years later, in 1990, the first MD-11 airliner made its maiden flight. Now there are only a few dozens of aircraft in commercial operation most of which in freighter versions in the park of FedEx Express. The flights of the passenger airliners were completed in 2014. There are only cargo modifications, aerial tankers and several special versions left in operation. 
The DC-10 became the second white body airliner in the world, and in a way, it was a search for ways to develop civilian aviation. It was the first representative of a special breed of three-engine giants, whose history on this channel will continue. This is it for today. Like the video and subscribe to the channel, so you won't skip other stories. Fast flights and soft landings to you.